Did Carlos Mendoza tip his hand for what the Mets lineup is going to be this season? A breakdown how the Mets should stack up their stars on today's edition. Locked on Mets. You are locked on Mets. Your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Now, the New York Mets had Jeff McNeil back in the lineup on Tuesday, and I believe Carlos Mendoza put forth a lineup that we might just see on opening day. Here's how they stacked it up. Brandon Nemo batting leadoff, Francisco Lindor batting second, Pete Alonso batting third, Jeff McNeil batting cleanup, Starling Marte fifth, Francisco Alvarez sixth, Brett Beatty seventh, Mark Vientos eighth, and then Harrison Bader batting ninth. Now, when you look at this lineup, what I'm really most interested in is one through four. How are the Mets going to stack those hitters and who's going to protect Pete Alonso if he is batting third? There's been a lot of discussion this offseason that I've seen on social media about how you can change up this lineup. Maybe Jeff McNeil should bat leadoff. Maybe Francisco Lindor should bat leadoff. Should Pete Alonso bat second? Should Brandon Nemo bat third or fourth because he now tapped into a little bit more power? I really dove into this for today's show. Looking at the splits for the top four guys in this lineup throughout their careers, where they've batted, looked at where they've hit better, looked at how they performed with the bases empty or runners in scoring position. Ultimately, the conclusion I came to first among everything else is Brandon Nemo should not be moved out of that leadoff spot. I did a show, I don't know, probably last month talking about Nemo's versatility and how moving to left field is going to be good for his career, and how moving down the lineup could eventually be good for him as well. And while I do believe that is the case when you get to a point where a Jet Williams maybe is established as a big leaguer, walking at a 20% clip, if he can actually carry that over, with all the speed in the world, it might make more sense that he's a table setter. Elisa Helicuna, another guy that could profile as a top-of-the-order bat. And Jeff, and excuse me, Nimmo, as he continues to progress in his career. If he keeps on tapping into that power, maybe it does make sense. For this current team, he should be the leadoff hitter. You look at career on base percentage. Brandon Nemo, 380 career on base percentage. Jeff McNeil is at 361. Francisco Lindor at 341. Those two guys should not bat leadoff over Nemo. Stalin Marte at 343. So when you just look at who's going to get on base the most, who's Arguably the best hitter on this team. I mean, you can make that case when you look at weighted runs created plus, which is measuring hitters on a league average of 100. When you look at batting average on base percentage, the guy who gives you the most consistent at bat is Brandon Nemo. So I think he should bat lead off. And further evidence of that, last year with runners in scoring position, Brandon Nemo hit 245. With the bases empty, he hit 272. And for the season, he batted 274. Keep him where he's comfortable. He's played 760 games in his career. 520 have come in the leadoff spot. In the last two years, he's almost exclusively batted leadoff. So that's one spot that ultimately I think they should just stick to. Now, when you get further down the line, tonight they went with Francisco Lindor batting second. All right. Career OPS for Francisco Lindor across different spots in the lineup. Batting leadoff, 855. Batting second, 783. Batting third, 801. Batting cleanup, 874. Granted, that's only 27 games played. Throughout his career, he's primarily batted somewhere between first and third in the lineup. And you take it by year now. 2015, he batted second primarily. 2016, he batted third. 2017, he was split a little bit more at batting second, uh, but also a fair amount batting first. And then 2018, he was almost exclusively a leadoff hitter. And that was arguably the best season of his career. He had 37 home runs out of the leadoff spot, 38 altogether. 
So a great season that explains that OPS of 855 as a leadoff hitter, because that was the big, big season where he did it. He batted first in 2019 as well, had a decent year. 2020 split between first and third. Since he came to the Mets, he's either batted second or third. 2021 primarily batted second, his worst year at the Mets. Um, 2022, best year, primarily batted third. 2023 split between second and third. You can make a case if you want to, that maybe Pete Alonso should bat second and Francisco Lindor should bat third. You got some more at bats to Pete. There's been all those different, you know, analytically driven franchises that stick the best hitter second. So you'll see, uh, you know, Mike Trout bat second or, uh, you know, Freddie Freeman or Mookie Betts. You know, they were batting one and two a lot. So Freeman batting second. Um, you know, Acuna, he bats lead off, right? If I'm not mistaken. So it, it goes both ways, but having your best hitters batting first or second to just get him the most played appearances possible. You can make that case. And the career track record would tell you that Lindor is a little bit better in the three hole than the two hole. Overall, I understand why the Mets would want to get P. Alonzo more RBI opportunities. So I'm cool with keeping Lindor second and Alonzo third. But I think those two guys are interchangeable. You go to Alonzo splits. He's batted fourth, 404 games out of his big league career. Second, 111. Third, 132. Those are his primary three spots. Career OPS, 938 batting second. Batting third, 824. Batting fourth, 860. Further evidence that maybe Alonzo's second does make some sense. 2019, he batted second for 72 games. So that's where you're going to get a lot of that OPS. He was amazing that year. He batted third 54 times. Fourth, 28 times. 2021, he batted cleanup 87 times. Third, 34 times. Second, 30 times. Then Buck Showalter became the manager of the New York Mets. And he saw Big Pete Alonso and said, you are a cleanup hitter, son. He batted him 150 games at cleanup in 2022, 129 games at cleanup in 2023. Now, the 2022 Mets were old school. It was your traditional table setters. Brandon Nemo, Starling Marte atop the lineup, Lindor batting third, Alonzo cleanup, and it worked for them. That year, Jeff McNeil batted anywhere between fifth and eighth for 115 games. He was primarily in the bottom part of the lineup. He had his best season. He batted third for 21 games. He's only batted cleanup seven times in his career. So why would I say that Jeff McNeil should be the Mets cleanup hitter for this season? Look at batting average with runners in scoring position. Let's say, oh, you don't want McNeil batting cleanup. Why would you want McNeil on with runners in scoring position? Last year, who led the team in batting average with runners in scoring position? Jeff McNeil didn't have the best year. Guess what? He hit 318 and led the team with runners in scoring position. In 2022, who led the team with runners in scoring position? Jeff McNeil batted 336. 2021, who led the team with runners in scoring position? If you are watching on YouTube, you see a smile on my face. It's actually not Jeff McNeil. He was the worst on the team. Had a horrible season. He batted 170 with runners in scoring position. Not a good year for Jeff. But you go back to 2019, who led the team with runners in scoring position? It was actually Nimmo and McNeil, but Nimmo in a far shorter sample size had that neck injury. He was out for a while. Jeff McNeil batted 350 with runners in scoring position. If the idea is to get Brandon Nimmo, Francisco Lindor, and Pete Alonso the most at-bats, I understand batting them one through three. Those are your best three hitters, or at least coming off last year, your best three hitters. I can make an argument that throughout their careers, Jeff McNeil could be considered a better hitter than Francisco Lindor um, just as a pure hitter, but he's very up and down. And also, he does have that versatility to hit anywhere in your lineup. And I get that that is attractive. And I imagine that even if he is a cleanup hitter primarily to start the season, he will toggle around a little bit. But to me, I think the place that I look at this lineup and actually wonder, maybe you can make a switch. Surprisingly enough would be Alonzo batting second and Lindor batting third over changing Jeff McNeil, because let's just say you you flip things around and you have McNeil batting lead off. You go McNeil, Lindor, Nimmo, Alonzo. Now you got Nimmo out of place. Alonzo's batting cleanup, so you're not getting him in every first inning. 
I don't know if I want Alonzo batting cleanup anymore. As much as he profiles as that RBI guy, and I understand why Buck Showalter stuck him there, I want Pete Alonzo to get as many at-bats as possible. So, you know, you could play with that. You could maybe have Lindor bat lead off instead of Nemo. Flip those two guys, and and you know maybe it's actually Lindor, Alonzo, Nemo, McNeil. Maybe that's your best lineup. And if you believe that, I'm all ears. But I really think that Brandon Nemo makes the most sense batting lead off. If you put Jeff McNeil second, you're stacking your lefties. Your lineup then gets pretty righty heavy when you get past. You know, even if you you put, I, I guess one thing they could do is they could have McNeil second, Lindor cleanup. I wouldn't be opposed to Lindor cleanup. I really wouldn't. He hasn't done it much in his career, but if you told me that the best three at bats in the game that you wanted to get them up to the plate the most was Brandon Nemo, Jeff McNeil, and Pete Alonso, I wouldn't be mad at it. So that's one thing I could kind of see. But ultimately, I think to have the switch hitter batting second in between the lefty and the righty in Nemo and Alonso, it makes a lot of sense. Um, like I said, last year, Francisco Lindor batted second a ton, had a good year. So I think the line they had tonight, surprisingly enough, even though you look at Jeff McNeil, hasn't done it a lot and say, him at cleanup? I mean, you think of a cleanup hitter as a guy that's going to hit your 40 bombs, and that is not Jeff McNeil. But it actually makes sense to me. I think the one other gripe I actually have is I bet Francisco Alvarez over Starling Marte. I would go, you know, Nemo, Lindor, Alonzo, McNeil, Alvarez. So you have, in my mind, the best two power hitters in this lineup. Um, just pure power. Lindor might hit more home runs than Francisco Alvarez, but still, I think pure raw power, it's Alonzo and Alvarez. So to sandwich McNeil in between them, I think makes a lot of sense. If your one through three guys end up going down in order, guess what that also sets up? Jeff McNeil's batting leadoff in the second inning. Not a bad place to be in. And then I guess in this instance, maybe the argument that the Mets would say for having Alvarez bat six is in that second inning, you would have McNeil and Marte, two guys who could get on in front of Alvarez. So if that's their thought process, again, I can come around to it. The bottom part of the lineup, I'm not going to really gripe over too much. Beatty, Vientos, I think that ninth spot going to Harrison Bader and Tyrone Taylor is fine. There could be some value in nine. And so I think there is a world where Starling Marte batting ninth to give you a double leadoff is really, really nice. At the same time, I do think there's some ego you got to play to with Stalin Marte and batting him ninth, I think is something he would not appreciate. So maybe that's another reason you bat him fifth. Uh, overall, I think the line that the Mets had today for what is currently in house is probably the best fit. And I would actually be curious to see how Jeff McNeil does in that cleanup spot. You might be surprised if he stayed there all year and had a good season, he might drive in 80 runs. And I know that that sounds a little bit funky, but I'll tell you what, he has done really well with runners in scoring position throughout his career. I was surprised at those numbers and it makes sense. You know, when you have runners in scoring position, you know, you have infielders that are holding on runners and that just opens up more holes. Guys aren't quite on their toes and set the same way as when the bases are empty. And Jeff McNeil is a guy that can exploit that and put some runs on the board. So I actually like it. Now, who's going to make this team? On yesterday's show, I teased that today's show, I would give you my opening day roster prediction. We got some more roster cuts today that made the decisions slightly easier on me. There were guys that we kind of expected to get cut. But I'm going to go through that now next. Who got cut and where this roster stands, who I believe will make the team come opening day. We'll get to all that in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Testing your skills on prize picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because if you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with just a few taps because daily fantasy sports is made easy with prize picks where you pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Right now, you can even look at MLB season stats. So you can find the MLB season tab, that's MLB SZN. And you can look at RBIs, for example. See Pete Alonzo at 108 and a half. You take more on that because, of course, Pete's going to drive in at least 109. Look at Matt Olson last year. What was he in the 150s or 140s for RBIs? This year, the number is set at 109.5. Take more there. Juan Soto at 103 and a half. I think he's going to drive in more than that. 
Go more on all three. Combine them. You can win big. Download the app today. Use the code Locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Again, download the app today. Use code Locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. All right, baseball fans. Tonight is the night. You want to make sure that you don't miss out on the best MLB season preview out there coming exclusively to Locked On Sports today, which is the first ever 24-7 national streaming channel on YouTube, as well as on the free Amazon Fire TV channels. It covers everything in the world of sports. But tonight at 7 p.m., if you tune into that YouTube channel or find it on Amazon Fire TV, you're going to see your MLB season preview for each of these divisions. You'll see myself and the other hosts of Locked On NL East. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Again, 7 o'clock tonight on Locked On Sports Today. And the Mets made some roster cuts. They cleared out a lot of the NRIs, uh, which, of course, is non-roster invites. Here are the names that were reassigned to minor league camp. You have Kyle Crick, who we never saw was dealing with an injury, Yaxel Rios, and Cole Solcer, which leaves Austin Adams as the last NRI standing. I'm proud of that because I have been talking up Austin Adams all offseason, and particularly in spring training. I think he has a very, 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 very small chance to make this team. I kind of doubt it, but he's the last guy there. So uh, good for him on that note. When it comes to the position players, Ben Gamble, Trace Thompson, and Yolmer Sanchez were reassigned. Trace Thompson you know, was great in the beginning, but he slowed down throughout camp there. And ultimately, it was always an uphill battle for him to make the team. He'll be in Syracuse with Ben Gamble, I guess, sharing an outfield with Drew Gilbert. Trying to think who else is in that outfield. I guess it probably would be those three for most games to start the year until a uh, Jet Williams made his way up, or uh, if there's another top prospect that is escaping my mind right now. But uh, you'll see a lot of those guys in Syracuse, Yolmer Sanchez as well. Um, this leaves G Man Choi, Luke Voigt, and Jose Iglesias as the last NRI standing. Technically, also, you have Tomas Nino, Hayden Sanger. But the catching situation is pretty much set. It's going to be Alvarez and Nervaez. There is still that chance that the Mets pull off an 11th hour trade where they send Nervaez somewhere where he can play every day and get a prospect back. But that trade has never come this offseason. So I imagine Nito and Sanger will be the backstop in Syracuse. And that leaves the competition for the last bench spot to Choi, Voigt, Iglesias, and Zach Short and DJ Stewart, who are on the 40-man roster. So with that said, who is guaranteed to make the team? Alvarez, Nervaez, Pete Alonso, Jeff McNeil, Francisco Lindor, Brett Beatty, Mark Viento, Starling Marte, Harrison Bader, uh, Brandon Nimmo, Joey Wendell, Tyrone Taylor. So that leaves you right there with one spot left. And right now I'm leaning and expecting G-Man Choi to grab that spot. He is my pick right now. Predicting the opening day roster. If there's 13 guys on it when it comes to position players, I think Choi is going to make it over DJ Stewart. I broke that down a bit in the third segment of yesterday's show. So if you didn't catch that one, you can go back and listen to my reasoning on it. But ultimately, I think that Choi has had the better camp. He has an opt out in his contract, as does Luke Voigt. Although, if Voigt opts out and he can find a deal somewhere else, by all means, I don't think it's going to hurt the Mets to lose him. Um, Iglesias, I don't even know if he has an opt out and ultimately with Joey Wendell in place, I just don't see the role for him to make this team. Um, and also making it over Zach short, he's outperformed Zach short, but Zach short's on the 40. So if you're trying to preserve your season depth and you wanted to carry an extra infielder, there might be a case for short. I think they'll pass short through waivers and hopefully he clears and that allows him, them to keep him, uh, you know, in Syracuse, if he accepts that assignment, Stewart has an option, and to me, that is one of the reasons why he ends up in Syracuse as well. So there you go. There's your other outfielder. Uh, they'll have to toggle Stewart with Gamble, Thompson, and Gilbert. Uh, but I think G. Manchoy makes this team. So that leads me now to the starting rotation. The way things are lined up, I can't remember who pointed this out. I want to say Mike Mayer did on Twitter. If it was somebody else, I apologize. Maybe you know, it might have been Tim Healy. One of those two. Follow both of them. They're great follows. Uh, but they said right now, the way things are lined up, the rotation is the same thing I've been talking about on this show for a while. It'll be Jose Quintana, which we already know for opening day. Luis Severino is going to get the nod for the second start. Then Sean Manaya. Manaya threw the ball really well tonight. Five innings pitched, 
four hits allowed, one walk, six strikeouts, got up to 69 pitches, which is super nice. He has a 309 year in camp right now. Uh, he's throwing the ball really well as of late. He said after the game, this is the best he's ever felt in spring. He's going to start against the Yankees in the final spring training game on Monday, which makes sense because then he'd turn around and start the third game of the season on Sunday. So got plenty of rest there. Beyond that, I would be very surprised if Adrian Hauser and Tyler McGill aren't the final two stars in the rotation. I will note that Hauser does have experience coming out of the bullpen, and I thought it'd be interesting to look up the splits. As a starter in his career, he has a 4-2-9 ERA over a much larger sample. In 61 and a third innings pitched out of the pen, though, Adrian Hauser has a 1.76 ERA. So a little food for thought there. Maybe when Senga comes back, if everyone's throwing the ball well, it could be Hauser. That is the casualty, of course. If they just have five starters, though, they'll probably just go to a six-man rotation. McGill had one bad start recently, but overall had a great camp. As much as Jose Budo has impressed, and Carlos Mendoza gloat about him today, saying, I've been very pleased not only with the way he's thrown the ball, but the type of person that Budo is. Despite that, despite the fact that he's given up only one run in 10 innings, I just can't imagine he makes this team as one of the five starting pitchers. If they decide six-man rotation to open the year, it's his job. But that's where this conversation gets really interesting trying to predict this roster. Because in one respect, Budo has an option, which means you can send him down. Another side of that is you could preserve that option and keep him in the big leagues, have him piggyback some starts early in the year when these guys are still getting ramped up. It's not the worst thing in the world to do. They also have options that could pitch in long relief, and maybe it does make sense to just keep Budo on a schedule starting because you're going to need him at some point this year, and that's ultimately where I believe the Mets will go with this decision. So now we get to the bullpen. you got five starters, then you'll have eight relievers. So Edwin Diaz, Adam Adovino, Brooks Raley, Jake Diekman, Drew Smith, they're all set, as well as Jorge Lopez. Now Jorge Lopez pitched another strong inning tonight, Struck out two, gave up a hit. Uh, his spring ERA is down to 257. So he's really pitched better as of late. The very encouraging sign. Jake Diekman worked a clean inning with a strikeout. And then Johan Ramirez, two scoreless, got up to 29 pitches, walked one, did not allow a hit, struck out two. Johan Ramirez has made an absolute case to make this team. And in my eyes, he might headline the competition for those final two spots. It's Ramirez. Sean Reed Foley, Phil Bickford, Shintaro Fujinami, Michael Tonkin, Austin Adams, and to a certain extent, Jose Budo. But for the sake of this conversation, I believe Budo starts in Syracuse. So six names for two spots. Who's going to grab those final seats in the Mets bullpen? I'll make my prediction next. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. And right now, last week here, get in on some spring training games. This is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. So you see the view from your seats before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. When I got tickets to go to Port St. Lucie over the weekend, I saw in the picture some shade over my seats. That's how I knew for sure I was under that overhang. Didn't see a wink of sun throughout the game. It was fantastic. All in prices show your total up front, so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. You can buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, even an hour after the event starts. So it's the place to go for last minute tickets. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code locked on for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We are nearly a week away from opening day, which makes this the perfect time to become a locked on Mets insider. This is our texting service where you get updates from me anytime something breaks on the Mets, where you can ask me questions anytime. It's also where we'll be sending lineups every day. So we get the starting nine texted directly to your phone. It's a really fun uh, way to interact with you all. I've appreciated those of you who have already subscribed. If you want to be part of the experience throughout the season, you can find the link in the episode description. Go to subtext.com slash locked on Mets. 
So let's go through this bullpen competition. We'll start with the most likely cuts. Austin Adams is very unlikely to make the team. He did have five scoreless outings before his blow up over the weekend. He leads all relievers in camp with 11 strikeouts. I think it's a testament to how much the Mets value him that he is the last NRI standing. With that said, he is an NRI. You know, he's not on the roster. He's on a minor league deal. Actually, I believe it is a split contract, but his, he's not on the 40. So I think he's going to get sent down. I, I think he'll start the year in Syracuse. Shintaro Fujinami is the other one. He has shown control issues that date back to last year. Those have also carried over into camp. He's only pitched four times. He got a later start. He has the minor league option. I think the Mets are going to use it, put him in Syracuse. And when he's lights out there, he'll force their hand and he'll come up and he could have a really big role by the end of this season, but he is a project. So this comes down to four relievers in my view, which I have discussed on this show before, but I'm going to make my predictions now. So you got Johan Ramirez, you got Sean Reed Foley, you got Michael Tonkin, you have Phil Bickford. I have been pretty consistent that Bickford's the guy I believe is DFA'd. Now, I'm going to make the case for him, though. He's hung around for a while with the Dodgers the last three years, has a great fastball, thrown a lot of innings. When I say great fastball, I should preface. He throws the ball hard. I don't know if I call it great. When you pitch to the ERAs that he has, maybe great's not the best description, but he throws hard. He's got about 180 innings pitched over the last three years. So he's been getting consistently 60 plus innings in big league bullpens. That's not nothing. With that said, he also has had a pretty good camp. Gave up three runs in his first downing, but since then has struck out six of nine without allowing a run. Six of nine batters he's faced, I should say. Now, the problem though is all those appearances have come at the absolute end of game. So he's facing the worst hitters that you can probably imagine in spring training. And we've seen other relievers get work earlier in games. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, but I just wonder, you compare Bickford to Michael Tonkin, who got a start, and I just feel like Tonkin is a better bet to make this team. So I think Bickford's going to get cut. There's also the fact that he can get J.D. Davis a little bit. He won an arbitration case, uh, which means that the Mets could release him, basically. And well, that's assuming he passes waivers, doesn't accept an assignment. It's a little bit complicated, but they could get out of the, a lot of the money that he's owed. It's not a lot. It's 900 plus K might be 940 K. I don't think that really factors into the decision too much, but I, I just ultimately think that they're going to go with one of the other or two of the other three guys. So this brings us to Tonkin, Johan Ramirez, Sean Reed Foley. Tonkin has a four or had a four two eight ERA last year and 80 innings pitch with the Braves. He was their long man, pitching a lot of blowouts in either direction. He has not a lot of run camp at four and a third. He did get that start where he pitched two scoreless. There is a lot of momentum that points to Tonkin making this team. What I keep coming back to is the fact that he signed a split contract. And I'm now like pulling my hair out about this because there's people that cover the Mets every day that are telling me he's out of options. And I just don't know what it means. Because a split contract was defined very clearly that he could be in the minor leagues this year. The Mets have that option. I did find one story in the Daily News, although I'm not a subscriber, so I didn't read the whole thing. Uh, But that does point out that he signed a split contract recently. So there's at least two of us who are on the uh, stance that you could put him in the minor leagues. But I've seen Anthony DeComo say he's out of options. I've seen Joe DeMeo of SNY say he's out of options. I could be wrong, but I believe I'm right. And because I believe I'm right, and because the Mets are trying to preserve their depth throughout this season, and because Johan Ramirez and Sean Reed Foley have thrown the ball really well and have really good stuff, I think Tonkin, unfortunately for him, is going to end up in Syracuse. With that said, my prediction is Johan Ramirez and Sean Reed Foley grab the last two spots. Now, I will note, if Sean Reed Foley starts the year on the IL, I think Tonkin grabs it. He has had some arm fatigue, but today he was throwing mid-90s in a bullpen session. They said that he'll get into a game later this week, and they anticipate he'll be ready for opening day. He, so far in camp, has struck out seven in four innings without allowing a run or a hit. He looks really good. I think another team would claim him. I don't think the Mets want to lose him. I believe he'll make it. And Johan Ramirez has pitched more innings than any other reliever, eight scoreless in spring, one walk, eight strikeouts. Today he got up to 29 pitches. 
he can fill that long man reliever role that Tonkin was expected to. And there is a world where maybe the Mets want two long relievers if they're not putting Budo in there. I could see Sean Reed Foley, again, either being IL'd or DFA'd, and it is Ramirez and Tonkin. The guy I'd be surprised if he didn't make the team is Ramirez because throws pretty hard, had a modicum of success last year, and has looked great in camp, and they're out of options on him. Again, with Tonkin, I believe having that flexibility, that's where I'm leaning Ramirez. If it really is true that Michael Tonkin does not have any options in the minor leagues despite signing the split contract, then I would change course and say Tonkin would make the team. And because he'd make the team, that would make Ramirez a little bit more tenuous where it'd be a coin flip for me, whether it be Ramirez or Sean Reed Foley. Um, and again, the Mets might just go in and grab Budo and keep him in the pen. And they might DFA Sean Reed Foley, Bickford, and Ramirez for all I know. But my prediction right now is the opening day bullpen will be Edwin Diaz, Adam Adovino, Brooks Raley, Jake Diekman, Drew Smith, Jorge Lopez, Johan Ramirez, and Sean Reed Foley. Already broke down the position players in the last segment. One final note before we close the show today. Brett Beatty homered. Got to shout him out. Um, we might have time for another Beatty show before we get to the season. We'll see. Um, tomorrow would be Thursday's show, so I won't be doing a Friday Farm Report. We might go Beatty. Um, we'll see, but I just had to note what he's done in the month of March. He now is homer for the second time. He also has a double, but after going one for 10 in February, he has gone nine for 31 with three walks, five strikeouts. He had four strikeouts in those first 10 at bat. So he's cut down the strikeouts. He's hitting 290 with a 371 on base and a 516 slug. So a much, much better close to camp for Beatty. Hopefully that carries over into the season. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. As always, I appreciate all of you for tuning in. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts on the audio side. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We're trying to get to 10,000 subs, but every subscriber counts. Maybe the next goal should be 9,000. So I appreciate all of you helping us get to 9,000 subs. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, on X, you can do so at Finkelstein Ryan. You can follow the show at Locked on Mets. If you want to be a Locked on Mets insider, you can find that link in the episode description. Thank you for making Locked On Match your first listen or your first watch every day. Now for your second watch, head over to Locked On Sports today. It's 24-7 streaming on everything in the world of sports. And make sure later tonight, 7 p.m., you tune in for the MLB season preview covering all 30 teams, all six divisions. So Locked On Sports today streaming 24-7 on YouTube as well as on Amazon Fire TV channels.